Good. As we continue in this sermon series about living a stellar life, we are following the lessons that our children will be learning this week in Vacation Bible School. Every day of Vacation Bible School, the children will be given a memory verse, a key verse to hold on to. And so in this sermon series, we're encouraging all of us to learn these same key verses that our children are taking to heart so that we might reinforce them in this community and truly live that stellar life that God has called us to live. Stellar, of course, means being the best you can be, being the brightest, standing bright and tall and strong in the world. And so hear now these words that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome contained in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 16. We hear these beautiful words telling us, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with the lowly. Do not be conceited. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I read a quote not long ago from a chaplain by the name of Ben Patterson, and he noted that people are very much like porcupines in a snowstorm. We need each other to keep warm, but we prick each other if we get too close. Because the truth is, we all have prickly quills that jab others in hurtful and painful ways at times. Each and every one of us does. For the scriptures are clear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We do things we don't intend to do that hurt and bring pain and discomfort into the world. And we don't do things that we should do that also cause pain and hurt in the world by their absence. Our Jewish friends, you know, are wonderful storytellers, and they do not mind making fun of themselves. So here is one of the stories from Jewish folklore that I like. The story talks about during a time when an old synagogue in Eastern Europe received a new rabbi, And when the morning prayer was to be said, half of the congregation stood and the other half of the congregation remained seated. And before he could begin the prayer, the people who were standing yelled at the people who were sitting and said, stand up. And the people who were seated yelled at the people who were standing up, no, sit down. Well, this happened week after week in his first few weeks there. And he called the people together and he asked them, what is going on here? Why do half of you stand and half of you sit? And then you yell at each other about who's right and who's wrong. What is the tradition of this synagogue? And the representatives from each side said, well, to know the true tradition of this synagogue We need to go and visit a homebound member who is 98 years of age. He will know where it all started and what the true tradition of this synagogue is. So the three of them traveled to this old man's home. And the rabbi asked the man, Can you help us with this problem? And the representative of those who stood looked at the old man and said, Isn't it the tradition of our congregation that we stand during that very important morning prayer? And the old man said, no, that is not the tradition. So the representative of those who were seated lit up and he said, so it is the tradition in our synagogue that we sit during the morning prayer. And the old man said, no, that is not the tradition. And the rabbi said, well, I am very confused. Because every, every, every single time, half stand, half sit, and we argue. And before he could get the rest of his words out, the old man said, they yell and they fight, right? And the rabbi said, yes. And the old man said, that is our tradition. <laughs> 
a tradition of fighting. I almost feel like that's what's happened in our world, don't you? A tradition of fighting. Because sadly, that old man was right. For too much of our history and too much of our individual lives, that has been our tradition. To fight with people who see the world differently than we do, who respond to things differently than we do. And we, in this chaos of confusion and conflict, don't know how to live in harmony with one another, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul and the Holy Scriptures call us to do. We are to live in harmony with one another. And yet we enter the chaos of conflict with those who look different, talk different, act differently, and think differently than we do. And the conflict begins even with young children. Toddlers and preschoolers squabble over toys. Kindergarten classmates disagree on what to play. Elementary school kids argue over who gets to go first and who gets to sit where. Middle school children, we see them dividing into cliques and offering criticisms behind each other's backs. In all ages, witness those of us who consider ourselves grown-ups. They witness us disagreeing with one another and being in conflict that pulls us apart and destroys our relationships. You know, it all started way back with Cain and Abel. Do you remember Cain and Abel? The first two siblings that are talked about in the Holy Scriptures. And you remember how their story ended. It ended with the first murder recorded in the Holy Scriptures. Brothers who could not get along and one killing the other. And we've been at each other's throats ever since. Not surprisingly, the Bible does talk an awful lot about conflict. From Cain and Abel to Jesus' own ministry, you remember how his disciples argued over who would sit on his right hand and his left when he came into his kingdom? Arguing about who was more important. And recall in the book of Acts, which some of you are studying in Sunday school, how Paul and Barnabas parted ways, arguing over the role of John Mark in the ministry. The Bible talks an awful lot about conflict. And the Bible talks an awful lot about how we are to live in peace as opposed to that conflict. How we are to be the peacemakers in this world and how we are to live in harmony despite our differences. The Word of God tells us that relationships do not have to be destroyed by our differences and the reality of conflict on this side of heaven. For the Bible bears witness over and over again to the fact that our relationships can indeed be strengthened through our conflicts depending upon how we handle those conflicts and treat our differences. In the scripture passage that we read today, the Apostle Paul reminds us very clearly that harmony happens when everyone is able to work together despite our differences. When we can find a way to appreciate each other's differences. For God calls us to live with compassion and kindness and grace in our relationships. Like that beautiful offertory that was just sung for us. Love is the answer to conflict. We as followers of Jesus can look to Jesus' life and see how Jesus related to people who were different from him. And instead of actively engaging in knock-down, drag-out fights with those people, Jesus shined the light of love and hope and healing into their lives in order to bring about harmony. 
And so I want us to look today at a few biblical principles that we can start applying in our lives and in the relationships all around us to help be those peacemakers that Jesus has called us to be and to help bring harmony into the conflict that we see in our world today. And the first thing that we need to do is to adopt a right attitude. Now, the right attitude in approaching conflict is humility. Remember how the Apostle Paul said, do not be conceited? Other versions of that same verse, other versions of the Bible say it this way. Do not think of yourself as more wise than you are. This one verse that we are reading today in the 12th chapter of Romans comes out of an entire section that talks about living together in harmony. Earlier in this passage, in verse 3, it says, Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. The right attitude is an attitude of humility. For I have witnessed in my own life and in the lives of others that in the heat of conflict, our very first reaction is to strike back, to believe that we are right and the other person is wrong. That whatever the conflict is, it is all their fault. And it only escalates the the battle when we take that stance. If we want to handle conflict productively, we need to first realize that all of us have our own perception of reality. When we are in conflict with another person, it may not be that that person is trying to be difficult to get along with they may really just see things differently than we do. They have a different perspective on what is going on in that situation. It's inevitable that men and women will see things differently and that parents will see things differently than their children and that siblings will see things differently from one another. No amount of love can erase our differences in perspective. We're each unique, and we look at the world through our own eyes. Not even passionate love of married persons can stop them from having differences of opinion. As James Thurber once wrote, marriage is the relationship between one person who cannot sleep with the window open and one person who cannot sleep with the window shut. Likewise, it's easy for some of us to identify with teenagers and think, oh yeah, well, when I was a teenager, but we forget how emotionally difficult being a teenager can be. We don't recall the pain of trying to figure out who we are and to fit in to that group of others. And so in dealing with young people, we always need to step back, clear our heads and our hearts, and listen to that young person's story and what their struggles are. What are they seeing? What are they feeling? Instead of projecting, well, I was a teenager too. We don't always know what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. There will be differences between human beings, and those differences can be the spice of life or the spite of life, depending upon how we respond. For people who are basically secure in their own personhood, differences may make other people very interesting to us. And conflicts may be seen simply as another problem that can be resolved. Differences can be opportunities for creative interactions, for people to live together in relationships in a community and find new ways of being and new things to do. We can wake one another up to a new point of view and a new way of seeing God's creation. Now, I know that's easier said than done. It's not always easy to see things from another person's point of view, 
especially if we've already formulated a very strong opinion ourselves about what is right and what is wrong. And anybody who dares to challenge that strong opinion within us, we immediately put up the Teflon, put on the blinders, close our ears, and just drive forward trying to force the other person to see it our way. But as Dr. Phil is famous for saying, how's that working for us? It's not producing harmony. It's not easy for us to see reality from another person's perspective. But the wise St. Francis once reminded us, seek first to understand before we seek to be understood. Taking the time to be humble enough to step back and ask the other person to tell us more about why they believe or think or do what they do. That's the first thing we need to do. Adopt a right attitude. And the second one is this. We need to adopt the right actions. Popular Christian counselor Gary Smalley in his book, The DNA of Relationships, writes these words. He says, we need to refuse to focus on what the other person has done and take a hard look at our side of the equation. It's the same thing that Jesus said, Matthew 7, when Jesus gave us those memorable words. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes and do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove that speck from your eye while there is a plank in your own eye? First, remove the plank from your own eye and then you will be able to see clearly the speck in your brother's eye. You see, Jesus knew that most conflicts are not 90-10. Most conflicts are 60-40 or 70-30. We share responsibility in our conflicts, my friends. And as leadership expert John Maxwell says, coping with difficult people is always a problem, especially difficult when that difficult person happens to be yourself. That means we need to enter these conflicts taking a serious look at our own selves, honestly asking what part we play in making that relationship difficult. To do so takes seriously our calling to be peacemakers in this world whose goal in conflict is reconciliation, not self-justification. Whose goal in conflict is to live together in harmony. Sometimes we can own our own contribution to a conflict by recognizing our mood and that our mood or our tone of voice did not communicate well what we meant to say. Sometimes our contribution is to recognize that what the other person did or said hit our hot button. And other times we need to recognize that it, our contribution is simply our own sinful response to conflict. In other words, our natural response to retaliate instead of seeking to understand. Adopting that kind of attitude in any conflict that comes up by owning the part that we have played in the conflict will help us to not be as defensive and will help the other person to let down their defenses and maybe pave the way for them to own their part of the conflict. Sometimes, sadly, even when we adopt the right attitude and the right actions, the other person doesn't respond and the conflict doesn't end. And in those situations, I want to encourage you to seek counsel, to seek counsel of someone else to enter into the conversation to help you. I know that many people feel like when they have problems and conflicts with others, it's a sign of weakness to ask someone else to intervene 
or they're embarrassed about the fact that they can't get along with someone in their family or someone that they work with. But my friends, is keeping up appearances worth living with the pain of hurtful and broken relationships? Is keeping up appearances and saving face worth having that destructive conflict eat away at your spirit? The scriptures often tell us when we cannot resolve conflict that we are to go and to ask an elder of the church to intervene and to be with us as a mediator in that conversation. In Proverbs, we read this, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Or as the message version of the Bible puts it, Refuse good advice and watch your plans fail. Take good counsel and watch them succeed. It's important to have the courage to reach out to others when you cannot resolve conflict by adopting the right attitude and the right actions. Now, I can't promise you that following all of these steps in every conflict you encounter, that that conflict will be resolved. But I want you to hear me when I say that unresolved conflicts do not have to ruin your relationships. The reality is that sometimes we simply have different perspectives on things and compromises cannot be made in those situations, especially when core values and integrity as followers of Jesus Christ are concerned. And at those times, we need to turn the relationship over to God and simply say to the one with whom we are in conflict, I'm not sure we're ever going to see eye to eye on this. So let's just agree to disagree. And then if you have to walk away, in order to have peace and in order for that person to have peace, you've done what you could. You see, we have the freedom in every conflict to choose how we will react, how we will relate with those with whom we have to interface whether we interface with them because they're in our families or we interface with them because they are at work or at school or our next-door neighbor, we have the choice to choose how we will respond to that conflict. In the scripture passage that we read today, the Apostle Paul reminds us of many ways that we are to live in harmony with one another. And one of those big things that we can do is to seek forgiveness and to forgive those who have hurt us. Recognizing that we ourselves often do the wrong thing and say the wrong thing. We don't always say the right thing at the right time. We don't always say the loving word. We don't always say the reconciling word. And so we need patience to learn how to say those two important words, I'm sorry. And we must learn how to forgive those who have hurt us. I've learned, like most of you, that I can't always do that in my own power. I need the power of God to change my attitude towards some of those who have hurt me, to persons who violate my trust, persons who offend me or hurt me. I need God's help to forgive and to stay in relationship. The promise of the Holy Scripture is that God will give us that help. Look at how Jesus treated people who were different from him. Jesus showered love on them, not hate. And so as he hung on the cross, he simply said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Reconciliation and peace are our goals, my friends. And God can bring beauty out of these broken relationships in our lives.
God can bring healing and peace if we turn our lives over. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.